Do you know about AWS budgets service? Oh. <laughs> I want to hear why we need package work just now. Interesting question. Um, In what ways uh, do you use uh, AI tools to boost your productivity? Um, po, 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 po. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, response. It's the first time I hear it. Hi, everyone. My name is Roman Zatiski from NGIX, and uh, I'm hosting the uh, English-speaking community here on YouTube channel today. It's uh, real great to have you here joining us uh, for the interview. And uh, today we are going to be talking about uh, things about uh, Node.js. But before we start, I'd like to introduce uh, what is NGIX. Uh, actually, NGIX is a program developed by EPAM that is aid for enhancing and propagating the best software engineering practices and processes across uh, the whole organization, the teams, and on individual level. Uh, it offers uh, lots of services, tools, and uh, educational programs to continuously improve uh, software development performance uh, and integrate uh, also integrate uh, GenAI tools into everyday working process. And also it's about uh, culture of excellence and innovation among uh, the engineering teams. So uh, today uh, it's an amazing session. And uh, we have uh, an interviewer, Viktor Saroka, here, and our interviewee candidate, Shakzot uh, Hojaev. And the topic would be Node.js. I'd like to give a couple of words to introduce, uh, first of all, uh, our interviewer, uh, Viktor Saroka. Hey, Roman, thank you yeah, for a great introduction. And I'm happy to be here. Uh, I've been working in TPAM for about 10 years, so have a bunch of experience. Uh, and uh, specifically, uh, yeah, inter looking forward into this interview for this role. So I am. I think I'm good prepared. So uh, it's going to be a really interesting question. So I'm, I'm, I think it's going to be fun. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for joining us today. And of course, uh, our candidate, Shakzad. Yes, I am Shakzad. I work, I've been working at EPAM for like two and a half years as a Node.js developer. And I'm pretty excited to be here and participate in this event. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. So we are all set up, both interviewer and candidate are in. And so I'd like to uh, announce the kickoff. And uh, me as the host, I will disappear in the background, and uh, the stage is yours, guys. So, uh, yeah, let's proceed with some general questions. Uh, uh, I usually like them to ask at the uh, start of any interview. Uh, I just want you to talk uh, uh, you about uh, your experience, uh, some um, challenges that you face, uh, probably describe the problem that you are most proud of uh, to resolve. Uh, uh, not necessarily a problem, but the challenge uh, that you had and that you successfully passed. And do you think that this is like the greatest of your achievements? Yes, um, I can start with my experience. Yes, uh, at EPAM, um, I had a project with AWS in it, uh, but we used to have only EC2 instances, like uh, everything was running in on EC2 instances. But it was not really um, effective for our case because we didn't have an, a lot of uh, loads uh, and uh, we, were, we, we were wasting uh, some of our money. And we decided to move to um, AWS Lambdas and it was pretty difficult uh, for us to do that um, because of many like uh, many unexpected uh, things that were occurring during the process. Uh, but eventually uh, we did that, so I'm really proud of that. Good. Uh, I also actually wanted uh, is, uh, AWS is one of my questions, uh, by the way, for this interview. Since you mentioned it, let's proceed with it. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you about uh, what makes uh, AWS and other cloud providers uh, 
you know, game changers uh, right now. Uh, why don't uh, we want to implement everything ourselves to reduce money, you know, uh, at all? Yeah, just pay for our own infrastructure, uh, our own use. Uh, don't depend on cloud that can, you know, just uh, raise the prices uh, one day and then, you know, we are in debt. I guess it is the time that is very crucial because when you use something like AWS, you don't need to spend a lot of time for building your own infrastructure, to finding proper specialists and so on. And probably most of the big companies uh, tend to spend those, those time to, to implement really uh, real features. To, to provide to their users and to get the uh, feedback and the profit quicker, faster. Um, yes, I think that is the most of the the most uh, important thing with the clouds. Okay, and uh, specifically to AWS, do you aware of the terms uh, uh, like? Um shared responsibility model uh, of the uh, cloud providers. What's, uh, what does it mean? Um, if I'm not mistaken, it is uh, like, like a diagram that represents what is the responsibility of the AWS and what is the responsibility of the customer, us. Um, like, like about security, for example. Security, uh, like physical security of the machines are on the AWS side. So the customers don't need to think about that at all. And the security, for example, in the, in the application that is hosted in AWS, that is already the, um, the thing that customers need to think about. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, correct. Yeah. So, uh, I wanted to understand that. Uh, when we talk about security, that AWS is not magically, you know, makes our application secure. Yeah? Something like you said, physical one is on their side, but uh, something that we set up is on our side. So this is why they they uh, wanted to make it really clear. So yes. um, good. Uh, let's talk about AWS Lambda service, like you said. Is it like... Um, um, ideal tool for each and every like task or would you consider it uh, only like uh, for certain kind of task and uh, uh, come up with something you know alternate some other solutions uh, for other cases i just want to understand pros and cons of this service and obvious lambdas have some uh, mm, limits limits of time that it runs uh, it is like if i'm not mistaken 30 seconds for uh, if you if you uh, use aws lambdas with ap gateway it is 30 seconds so it is not it is not enough for really big like uh, really uh, complex operations so uh, that's why aws lambdas mostly uh, preferred for quick, small uh, tasks that need to be done. Um, do, you, uh, do you prefer any real uh, life examples? Sure. Yeah, if you have such, uh, you can mention. Go ahead. Lambdas are really flexible and they can be used with multiple other uh, services of AWS and one of them is S3. So you can set up uh, a trigger for AWS Lambda when you publish a file, for example, in S3, and you don't need any server for that. So you don't need uh, a server to listen, to check the S3. So uh, Lambda, in this case, uh, really effective because it will be just triggered when the file is uploaded and uh, you operate the file. Uh, multiple questions on AWS, uh, we will move further. Um, so, uh, you know, um, with regard to many startups, uh, uh, it's not uh, news that uh, they prefer to choose AWS. And uh, sometimes I see some uh, articles that, you know, uh, somebody is in, in, in a great depth because uh, overnight the application went popular and, you know, uh, this Lambda executed uh, many times than expected. Uh, other cases like DDoS attacks, etc. 
what uh, would you do in order to prevent such cases as a, a, a developer yeah, for AWS services? Probably we need to use some uh, services for security to prevent the DOS attacks. I don't really remember the name of that service, but the OBS itself uh, really have that kind of services. Um, yeah, it's called AWS Shield. Yeah, indeed, it's a, a number of services. And also, do you know about AWS Budgets service? AWS Budgets are uh, is a service to help you to plan your budget. Like uh, you can set up a budget for each service, for example, and set up a value, for example, ten dollars. So if the if you spent more than ten dollars you will be getting uh, an email to your to, to your mailbox and you can just go to the to your account and stop the service that is uh, wasting your money yep uh okay uh let's proceed with another question similar to this topic actually but it's also important to to, to check and it's a good transition i think um yes so um now uh AWS service is usually used for some microservice uh, applications. Can you tell me um, what is microservice uh, applications uh, are about services? Like, and uh, can you compare them with monolith applications and, again, provide some pros and cons uh, to each of these uh, approaches? Yes. Uh, I use it to work uh, in a microservice project also. And the microservice is like a smaller version of a monolith i would say but with the concrete with the particular purpose like uh, to to manipulate with users for example or subscription service uh, and so on so the microservice have particular um, domain or something like that that it is responsible for and um, it also have from the technical side. It also have uh, its own database usually, and its own server. So it is isolated from other parts of the application. And the, so we are coming to the most to the one of the most important uh, pros of uh, microservice is uh, that it is not like different parts of your application are not uh, dependent on each other. So if one of them will stop working, for example, for some reason, so other parts of your application can easily continue, which is not usually possible with um, as monolith application. Um, yeah, but uh, microservices sometimes are difficult to maintain because as i said you will have another uh, a lot of servers for each of the, so you will have a server for each of the microservice so if you have 20 microservices you will get, you will have 20 servers to maintain uh, 20 uh, databases to maintain as well so it is uh, about maintainability you will yep. need some specialists and so on yeah yeah uh, yeah, I think we covered this topic. Uh, not for the questions here, uh, you mentioned uh, yeah important aspects. Uh, let's proceed uh, with uh, some general uh, qu question before we jump into the note. Uh, just wanted to understand uh, uh, how you understand the clean code, uh, like the quality on the code. What uh, do you look um, uh, into when you review the pull request uh, to understand it is. Uh, high quality uh, pull request code usually i i look if um if i understand it quickly so if i can understand it like uh, by reading it once the code uh it is written pretty well but if i spent like three or four times to read it to read it read it and uh, like spend five ten minutes to understand the code uh, it is a bit complicated i guess and also um, 
from the clean code perspective, I would look at the namings of variables and functions if they are clear. Um, also, I would uh, I would think about functions if they are um, if they do their their goal uh, if if they do only one thing if you say uh, simple uh, okay. yes uh, what principles do you know uh, and follow uh, in your uh, like daily routine yeah about writing code to make sure that it is also high quality for example like dry keys yagni solid Yes, uh, I use I use Yagni usually. Uh, it is it says if I'm not mistaken, you ain't gonna need it. Uh, it is about that you don't need to write a code for the future. Uh, like I will need it next week, so I will write it right now. Uh, no, but usually it is a bad practice. Um, also, yes, kiss. Um, what was that? Keep it simple. Keep it uh, something simple. Stupid. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so it is about complexity of the code. You don't need to write difficult code. You need to write simple code to understand. Um, yeah, dry also. Uh, don't repeat yourself like uh, try to reuse the code um, um yes probably these are the main ones and about solid uh, what uh, not necessarily need to explain in the every but what do you think most is like for, your, for yourself in your practice like important uh, principle of solid uh, to definitely follow you know no matter what like ideally of course we want to follow them all but sometimes it's not feasible i just want to understand from your perspective uh, how you how you work with solid yeah and follow it i have i have the favorite one yeah. of mine it is dependency inversion uh, because when i started working in my recent project uh, i was mostly working with tests Mm -hmm. And most of our classes uh, were using, were importing a module and using it in the functions in the class. So uh, there was no dependency injection uh, in the classes. So it was really difficult to test those uh, functions. And uh, I uh, really worked with that uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I use a dependency injection to implement dependency inversion of solid and that was really useful. I will uh, I keep uh, I keep uh, complying that uh, principle most of the time. Yeah, understood. By the way, I just also wanted to transition to testing. It's also about quality. Um how do you make sure that uh, the Node.js applications uh, are tested. Uh, what types of tests uh, do you write? Uh, uh, what type of tests you can write to make it even better? Uh, yeah, just want to understand what is a what are ways to test the ES and not uh, JS applications. Mm -hmm. There is a testing pyramid. Uh, I can start with that. Uh, it is. It contains of unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests. Uh, in practice, in uh, in Node.js projects, I usually like uh, the pyramid is very uh, correct from my perspective because we usually write most of the unit tests firstly, then we write integration tests. They are less than unit tests, and um, in the end, we usually write end-to-end -end tests. Uh, I can compare them if you want. Yeah, please uh, go ahead. Uh, unit tests are usually written for the, uh, a small piece of code or a simple function, for example, a method, and um, it tests it without any um, uh, any 
dependencies from outside let's say uh, we usually mock some dependencies if the function has some kind of um, when we don't mock them for example if uh, if a function calls another function from another class for example uh, if we don't mock that uh, it usually uh, becomes an integration test uh, integration test uh, tests uh, how two or more uh, parts of the application work together and the last one in twin test is the really uh, difficult one for me uh, it usually tests some real use cases uh, use paths for example user login or user register and uh, it calls real endpoints of the backend uh, one by one to pass that uh, user case and why did you say that it's difficult for you um, because it is complicated, uh, because you need to think a lot of, uh, you need to think a lot of, uh, details, uh, you need to call a lot of endpoints to test it, uh, to pass the scenario, uh, whether when you write a unit test, you just, uh, test one simple function and it is more easier. Yeah. Uh. By the way, with end to end tests, uh, are there any other problem like uh, with, uh, like, uh, did you have some, some problems with insta instable, uh, instable tests uh, when, you know, sometimes it runs and for some reason because of other, like, different factors, it may fail? You mean flakiness of the end to end tests? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this is one of the, problems with them like it's known factor is like uh it's uh, it's okay um everybody knows about it but sometimes you know uh, for example if db the database is down then your test will fail right so mm -hmm. uh, with the unit test you won't have such problem but like you said this is like the real like the most real like test and but sometimes it can give you such result just because of uh, other factor, uh, for example, like third party service is down, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I guess uh, that is the purpose of intent tests to see if everything works together, like uh, whole application works. If you get an error and fa your test fail, I guess he, I would uh, go into it and check uh, if everything is working it is like an alarm for me yeah i, I understood i agree um uh, so uh what about other kind of types of tests so especially for uh, not js for backend uh, stuff uh, did you write any uh uh tests uh, to test the performance of your uh not just applications uh, to so some word testing as well what was this experience of yours? Did you find some issues with it and eventually make it better? Actually, in my recent project, we used to write intent tests uh, that were used also for as, as load tests. Uh, so uh, I can say that uh, I used to write uh, load tests uh, that we were running to... Um, to find the the limits of our application uh for example the login uh, scenario uh how many logins uh, per second or per minute our application can handle that i guess that's the purpose of load tests yeah good uh it's enough here uh can you tell me how do you usually deal uh with uh uh, asynchronous um, stuff in unit tests. For example, like uh, uh, you know, uh, there is some some timers, some uh, some uh, and other calls. Like you said, uh, you know, how do you deal with that uh, in, in unit? I tests? usually mock them. 
use, using the framework pos opportunities. I usually use Jest for tests, and it has lots of opportunities to mock uh, whether a single function, or you can also mock a whole module. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, just interested to understand what do you decide what to test and what not to test. For example, like you have the application, right? Uh, what definitely you would not test overall, like not on the specific uh, about uh, backend, but overall, like uh, in unit testing, what is like usually we don't want to test. For example, like uh, uh, just uh, an, a leading question for you. Imagine you have a class uh, with public interface, yeah, but you definitely have some methods for. Yes, we usually don't test private ones. Private uh, methods uh, usually they are tested uh, when we test uh, public methods because they are called from the public methods. So yeah, we usually don't do that. Yeah, uh, I, you know, as we in JavaScript, we can technically do it. Like we can, uh, you know, surprise this. Uh, yeah, yeah, we uh, can. I did. I did this way. Uh, for like uh, t uh, t t testing the uh, using the, our internal tool autocode to test uh, users uh, tasks uh, you know I just want to make sure that they did it uh, good but uh, again this is like to check that somebody did the right thing uh, and I have specifically put there like TS ignore error you know uh, <laughs> that it is like complaining that it is private you cannot access it but we understand in JavaScript we can access uh, uh, almost everything uh, just you know interesting fact. Um, so, uh, let's proceed, uh, with code coverage. What was question, um, here, uh, how do you treat this metric, uh, and what, uh, value do you think is like good, uh, you know, consider it good. What, what value do you consider good? I usually like 100%, but yes, most of the people think that 100% uh, can be reached with uh, some uh, stupid tests that uh, don't test anything uh, just to cover all the lines of the code. But that can be done for me, that can be done for 80% so also, for example. 80% also can be reached by that way. Um, but uh, if I would uh, need to set uh, set a limit, I would set one hundred percent. And uh, after that, it is my responsibility if I am a team lead, for example, to to control that. that the test. <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting uh, response. I it's the first time I hear it. Uh, you know, I don't mind. I mean, in case, it, like I said, uh, like. Like it is not like uh, um, like we know like uh, if we can achieve it pretty fairly easily, yeah. Why not? Yeah, the bet the more the better. I, I think. Uh, so I I understand that people complain about one hundred because you know they think that sometimes it's really hard, you know. But technically speaking, yeah, uh, you correct. We can achieve it, uh, and you know sometimes projects might also decide this. So. Uh, and this is uh, not everything in our control. I mean, sometimes uh, I hear I heard that some projects want one hundred percent. So, uh, but it's interesting that you said that uh, one hundred percent in our project. So, uh, <laughs> I got it. I'm there for two years, and it is my it is in my blood already. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let's proceed um, with um, yeah. Let's proceed with not just related stuff. Uh, and let's start with uh, uh, Samware uh, term. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain what is it, uh, why it's needed? Uh, uh, yeah, different use cases. Yes, it is uh, semantic versioning that is used to versioning the NPM packages usually, um, where we have three numbers. Um, like first one is the measure. Uh, measure so it is usually incremented when some major changes uh, made to the application and the second one is minor minor changes to the application and the third one is patch uh, a patch is like a minor minor box fix it and something like that 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, can you tell me about? Um, so, imagine I want to install the certain dependency, uh, uh, third party one, yeah, and I want to install it so I uh, can uh, have any like patch version, but I don't want changes in the major in and minor. How would you? How, how can I achieve it? That uh, uh, we have two symbols for that. Um, yeah. We have a carrot and we have a sign of like tilde, approximate. yeah, yeah. Uh, tilde. Um, oh, I'm lost right now. Which one uh, is? Yeah, which one is for what? Yeah, I guess you... the carrot is for uh, minor and patch. Like we can update minor and patch if we yeah. use a carrot, and we, if we use tilde, it is. It updates only the patch version. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that, that's correct. And can you tell me why do we need this package work JSON file? Uh, and also, we have Shrink Wrap, which is kind of like about the same. Uh, frankly speaking, yeah, I, I'm definitely frankly speaking right now. I don't know myself the whole difference about Shrink Wrap and package work. I use in my project package work and it works fine for me. But you know, if you know, uh, please uh, clarify, and I will check additionally after the, the this interview. But uh, at least uh, I want to hear why we need package log JSON. Um, package log JSON is a file that contains a tree of dependencies of our project, uh, and it is usually we usually need it when we work together with multiple de- developers for example and uh, for example let's say i installed a new dependency into the project and uh, when i install it when with npm the npm updates the tree in package log json also and i Push it to the GitHub, and for example, you uh, download it, to, you pull it, and try to npm install as well. And in this case, um, uh, if we don't have package log JSON, you might install some different uh, version of the package uh, because we use usually the carrot, the tilde that we told uh, already, and uh, without package log JSON, uh, for example, I might have uh, the first patch version. You might have ninth patch version, and they are they might be different in some cases, and uh, it may lead to some problems. And uh, but package log JSON explicitly sets the the version without any carrots, without any tildes, so you install the particular version of the package. Uh, so it uh, solves that problem. Like uh, usually uh, developers say is that uh, something like it works on my laptop. It should work. Um, if we talk about shrink wrap, uh, it is almost the same. It is like the same file, but it is usually used when you write some npm packages yourself when you publish your package to npm registries um, uh, because and package log json usually is not loaded to npm registry when you publish your package and but shrink wrap is loaded there and it's um, uh, it guarantees that uh, other people who download your package use the same uh, versions of the packages in your project. Perfect. Yeah, good to know. Uh, thanks for the detailed answer here. Um, another like use case uh, on an npm. I will move closer. So uh, I think you also had this uh, case uh, example. You want to just install some package, new package, and then you have like error uh, that. You know, it, I cannot install this package because it relies on some other package that needs to be also like updated. Uh, uh, for example, like uh, for Next.js application or for Express application. I just you know thinking uh, on the spot. Uh, what can we do uh, 
to make this pro- error away and still like install the dependency. For example, like overrides uh, and or peer dependency, uh, we can skip the check of uh, peer dependencies. Did you have such uh, like needs, uh, such experience? I haven't used any peer dependencies before, but mm-hmm. uh, I have read about that. Uh, uh, I know a bit why do we need it, but I didn't have any experience with them. Yeah, uh, maybe it's more uh, like uh, relevant for front-end development, especially uh, as I am more uh, like writing front-end code, but I see uh, right now, for example, like we have uh, versions of the package uh, react yeah and my project uses 17 versions uh, 18 is out there and and then many packages already updated to it so sometimes when i install the package i see such errors that they require 18 and teens react and um you know but i see that they can work actually with 17 so um, only after checking this 100 percent i do this override in order just to make this um, error go away uh, you know, during the installation. Okay, let's proceed uh, with uh, like general concepts of Node.js. Um, so, um, yeah, let's actually let's jump a little bit like deep. Um, sometimes I hear candidates uh, don't know about it, but how do you understand libuv? What is libuv in the Node.js? Uh, you know, it is. A library that is mostly responsible for um, for asynchronous operations in Node.js because Node.js itself is one threaded uh, environment and it is not um, it cannot work asynchronously uh, and LibUE gives that opportunity to Node.js and uh, this it's event loop. Uh, mostly, and yep. I guess we need to talk about that also. Yeah, uh, we will talk about it right now. But I just want to ask, uh, yes, yeah, just interesting question. Uh, what language is uh, this libuv uh, written in? Oh, yeah. I guess C plus plus or something yeah. like. And uh, uh, by the way, did you know that you can also write uh, not JS programs using this C plus plus plus? You know. And then include it to Node.js and then execute. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw sometimes, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I did not do it myself, of course. But uh, <laughs> I, I heard that, especially for mobile development, sometimes people do that. Uh, um, yeah, maybe it's uh, like uh, more, uh, more native, something like that. Okay, okay, yeah, but uh, yeah, b- uh, going back to your uh, like statement about event loop, of course, yeah, let's talk about it. It's the heart of uh, Node.js, and this, as I was saying, might sometimes be crucial uh, for correct logic of the application. So uh, can you tell me, uh, yeah, about event loop, even more details, everything that you can tell about it, and after it, I might ask some additional questions. Yeah, event loop's heart is, uh, is the phases it has six phases and two side phases. Um, when we run our, uh, for example, we have index.js file and we run it using like node index.js. Uh, Node.js goes through you through the file and evaluates everything. Like um, it runs firstly the the asynchronous operations it puts uh, it it runs the timers if we have any and so on if we talk about phases uh, there there are six phases the first one is timers um, it is responsible for uh, for timers uh, we have uh, console not console um, what was that set timeout and say set interval for example and uh, the next one is uh, pending callbacks and i guess it is called somehow different also um it is for any callbacks that are uh, that are ready to be to be executed uh, after some 
uh, after some operation. And the third one is uh, idle, idle phase when we when we wait. Oh, when we um, I'm really lost in this phase. Uh, I would uh, I would move to the next one. I guess. Yeah, go ahead. The, uh, uh, the fourth one is uh, pulling when we when we expect some IO operations to to come to our event loop, and next one is check when we run set immediate um, callbacks callbacks that are set with set immediate uh, function, and the last one is close close phase when we run the callbacks of uh, um, any closing operations like if we have any sockets for example uh, sockets uh, have usually uh, um, an event for example uh, on close we we pass a method we pass a callback uh, to that close event and that callback is usually uh, executed in this phase. Yep. Uh, what about uh, microtask queue also? I really uh, forgot to tell about them. Uh, microtasks are usually promises, mostly promises, and we also have another another side uh, phase is um, next stick. Next tick, yes. Uh, process next tick. These are the side phases, and uh, promises are usually um, executed after each each phase. For uh, uh, like after each phase, we see if we have any promise callbacks that we have uh, that we need to execute. And promise next tick uh, is almost the same, but they are different in. In the way they are, uh, they are declared, and also, if I'm not mistaken, process next tick. Uh, we search, we we see if we have any process next tick after each line of the code. Uh, I I read that somewhere, and I remember it. Maybe it is not correct, but I think maybe. Uh... I also might be wrong here. Maybe after each of these phases that you mentioned, they, these are checked. Mm-hmm. And by the way, uh, what uh, do you, what do you think is executed first, uh, next tick or uh, promises? I guess uh, next tick. Yeah, and this is correct. Um, actually, um, yeah, with regard to yeah, um, this question is really uh, is really like m- might be wide. So let's uh, maybe look at some example that will, um, yeah, check your knowledge uh, of this uh, uh, of this process here. Yeah? And for that, I'm gonna uh, present uh, the screen. Okay, so thought, yeah. Now we got uh, the editor. Uh, so here uh, you see some uh, code uh, execution of different like. Um, uh, approaches here, yeah, uh, synchronous or synchronous, etc. Promises uh, next tick. Can you uh, go over this code and uh, explain uh, the order? Yeah, and not only the order, but uh, most importantly, why is this uh, this order? Uh, some code will execute first rather than the other. Okay, uh, looks really complex. Let's try. Um, so we have console log, set immediate, timeout, promise, oh, okay, it's 10, next tick, 10, next tick. <clears throat> okay, um, first of all, we need to start with uh, synchronous operations. These are one, the first one, console log, and Next one is number four, because uh, the body of the promise is synchronous also. Um, Next one is number 10. Uh, Number one, four, and 10. 
Okay, this it all with synchronous operations. Now we go into promises and next ticks. So promise ten, promise ten. Okay, this time timers will be completed in the end. Uh, now it is nine, I guess, because from next tick usually before promises. Next is uh, number five. It is the first promise, and it's console log. Mm, then number eight because um, or next tick. Oh, um, yes, promise is before next tick in this case, because uh, when we go into promise uh, promise queue, micro task queue, we need to complete it and then move to the next one. So we need to complete the promise queue first. It is five, eight, and uh, seven, and then six. Uh, I guess so. So what do we have left? Eight, seven, five, three and two left. Yes, I guess we have written down everything else. So in timers, mm, set immediate will be first uh, and then, or let me think, these two are really tricky because even, uh, for example, when we run these two only together, um, the result may differ from time to time uh, because uh, it depends on the machine where we are running it. Um, so uh, timers is the first phase, set so timeout is the fifth phase. So uh -huh. I guess timers will be first. I'm really lost here. Okay, let's let's double check. But I think, yeah, it's one, four, ten, nine, five, eight, seven. Yeah, is so you're correct. So if you say that it uh, might sometime uh, be different this this time, you will work it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but at least yeah, we understand that uh, yeah, this uh, uh, this this might happen. And I also, when I also prepared for this interview, I uh, got into such cases. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, good that you mentioned it. Uh, and also here, yeah, we see the important concept. Yeah, even though, uh, like you started in the phase, uh, explaining the, the point that, uh, uh, like timers, like seems like first, yeah, but we see actually they in this uh, in this code base they almost executed later because. The priority of next tick uh, and promises here yeah, are higher, and it checks uh, like you know uh, more yeah. often. Okay, good. So I am stopping sharing the screen, and we can proceed with other topics. Let's talk about uh, uh, course. Yeah, how do I understand course? Uh, when uh, why sometimes uh, you know uh, we see this problem in browser, but don't see this problem in Postman. For example, yes, um, course is cross origin sharing or cross origin resource sharing, I guess. Um, it is something like a policy uh, that exists only in browsers, as you said, and we don't have it in, uh, in other, um, other tools. Um, what does it do? Uh, when you request uh, an endpoint uh, from a backend application, uh, usually, uh, mostly, if if the course is enabled uh, on the backend side, uh, browser makes a pre-flight, pre uh, yeah, I guess it is pre-flight request. Uh, it is uh, sent to backend firstly before the main before the main uh, request to check if 
the requesting uh, site can access the data. Because, for example, backend might uh, accept only certain domains, for example, uh, or uh, certain uh, HTTP methods, uh, and so on. So, for example, uh, if backend uh, configure a course to accept only domain.com, and if you are requesting uh, the backend from domain2.com, so you will not uh, get the data. Uh, because you are not in the list of the uh, backend's uh, course configuration. Um, but why don't we get it in Postman? Because uh, this um, this check when when we send uh, that option uh, that preflight request, it is done by browser itself. So it is browser's responsibility to control. Uh, this process. So that's why we don't have uh, that kind of errors in Postman. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, by the way, um, why, um, you know, sometimes when I run uh, some uh, applications uh, uh, connect to back backend from UI, I see this course error, like, and it's complaining that access control our origin is set to star, yeah, sign. And so, uh, this is uh, is not working. Uh, what do, like uh, t talking from your experience? Do you consider like best best practice uh, to allow it for everyone, or like uh, to fine tune it and only allow it to only uh, domains that are uh, needed? Uh, the best practice is to set the domains that uh, should get the data. Because uh -huh. we, uh, when we write backend, we usually know who will be requesting the endpoints and the server, and we can uh, specify those domains. But maybe uh -huh. I have not uh, seen those cases. But maybe there are cases when, uh, when no, when uh, when we don't know uh, the domains beforehand. Maybe and maybe they can uh, they can uh, change time to time and in those cases maybe the star is more efficient. So, Sergio, uh, let's switch to another also important topic, uh, AI. So right now it's on a radar I think of everybody. Uh, uh, and with that, I just want to check uh, whether you use it already in your day to day work. And if yes, in what ways uh, do you use uh, AI tools to boost your productivity? Yes, AI is everywhere today, nowadays. And I also use it. Uh, I use usually uh, EPUMS AI. And uh, yes, I guess I, I use it every day. Uh, because maybe I I got uh, that lazy to Google something. Uh, if when I have any problem, anything that I don't know, um, I usually use AI. It is something like new Google for me. Um, also, uh, it also gives some uh, code snippets, sometimes the useful ones. And of course, uh, you cannot just copy and paste them. You need to uh, you need to change them to comply your project. But they are really useful nowadays. Yep. Uh, by the way, uh, what uh, specific services uh, do you use? I mean, even uh, uh, AI, it's uh, uh, you can choose uh, what tool uh, you can use, like ChatGPT, Gemini, uh, like uh, uh, whatever. Yeah, Llama. I usually use conversa conversational one, ChatGPT, and that's it. Nothing more yet. Yeah. Uh, and uh, do you use some techniques uh, when you form your prompts? Like, uh, uh, did you hear, hear about uh, zero-shot prompting or few-shot prompting? Uh, also, um, yeah, maybe you know about them and can talk from your experience about them. Um... Not really. Haven't heard of them. Mm, I usually use my own techniques. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Uh, 
yeah, but uh, I just wanted to say that, yeah, it's basically about the same. Maybe you use it already, but without, like, knowing that it's called, like, a uh, few short prompting. Basically, when you need uh, several, like, um, uh, queries here to achieve the result and you give examples, etc. Uh, yes, uh, that is the process of, uh, of my conversation with AI. Uh, I ask for something, it gives uh, not the full answer usually, and then I need to uh, I need to ask more questions, uh, more specific questions, and more details. Mm -hmm. And the last question here. Uh, did you do you know about a temperature uh, parameter that also can affect uh, the outcome of your uh, prompts? Um, yes, but I haven't uh, changed it uh, never when I use the Tpam AI, but I use it to work with it when, in my recent project when uh, we integrated AI with our own project. Uh, and in that time, I use it to like play with that, uh, setting it uh, higher or lower. And yes, uh, the temperature uh, simply is how creative uh, the answer of AI will be, I guess. Okay, yeah, Shakzot. I think we've done great so far. And frankly speaking, I could uh, proceed. Uh, for hours, you know, uh, having the conversations uh, with you because I feel like it's more like conversation rather than interview. So uh, I'm really impressed by your level and skills you showed. So, um, but I think we have a limit. So, uh, and that's why I'm passing word to Roman. Yeah, guys, that was a great experience to listen to you. Uh, and uh... You've touched the very important topic from my point of view, the AI, and uh, it is now not only a buzzword, but uh, the thing that is really happening and uh, how it is changing the industry. And uh, uh, me, as a part of uh, NGIX and Anywhere Club, I would like just to make a couple of you know announcements uh, regarding the uh, AI uh, and the courses that we provide. Uh, let me uh, now share my screen and let me now introduce uh, the courses, uh, the courses catalog of uh, Anywhere Club. Uh, so uh, basically about the uh, AI uh, in development, I would recommend uh, two of them. First is Prompt Engineering Foundations, which is actually uh, the entry level uh, course on how uh, to write prompts. It provides uh, an overall, overall uh, overview and uh, over the uh, basics of using AI and LLMs uh, and the essentials of uh, prompt tuning, formatting prompts, uh, fine tuning the prompts and uh, ethics on prompt engineering. So it, this is the entry level course uh, for all technical specializations, not only developers, but also QAs, business analysts. The second one uh, that I would like to introduce is uh, NGIX uh, AI supported software engineering course. This is uh, the main program that uh, is uh, best sold right now. So this is a self-paced learning journey designed to integrate uh, artificial intelligence tools into your uh, software development practices day on a day basis. This course is great for beginners and for intermediate learners, and it is about uh, uh, seven hours, uh, and it includes uh, five models and uh, 14 theory lessons and uh, nine practical tasks. Uh, you can uh, have practice uh, on the language that you are used to, it's JavaScript, Java, Python, and C Sharp. Enroll now to uh, transform your approach to software engineering with AI. That was my little part. By the way, for EPAM, Prompt Engineering 1 is mandatory for each and every EPAMer, so I already passed it and I, I can definitely recommend this one. By the way, uh, the advice that I provide to anyone I, uh, who asks me how to work at EPAM, I show these courses because actually when you just uh, send a CV to EPAM and say that I have passed the Prompt Engineering Basics at EPAM uh, from Anywhere Club or AI Assisted Development, this is a huge plus among all the other CVs that are sent to the HRs.
now I think that it is time to proceed uh, to the practical uh, part of the interview. Okay, so Shrizot, uh, let's uh, proceed with some uh, task that I think is kind of gonna show you uh, show your uh, level of um, working with um, popular yeah, uh, uh, framework uh, for Node.js. Um, yeah, by the way, um, you are not limited here to some specific one. You can uh, choose from uh, what you use on daily basis and proficient the most. Yeah, I just want to understand that you are capable of writing some, uh, you know, minimum minimal server uh, using uh, your favorite uh, Node.js uh, framework. It can be Express, etc. Um, or Happy uh, uh, that I saw in your CV. You are also like proficient in. Uh, but uh, what I want uh, from you basically to write a simple uh, HTTP server that has uh, ba basic crude operations for creating the user, uh, editing it, uh, uh, retrieving information about a particular user by ID, and also to remove this user. Uh, and also I want to see uh, error handling. Uh, so you can add uh, error handling specifically for crude operations, but uh, uh, also I want to consider uh, for you uh, to write some basic error handling mechanism in case you did not catch some errors in uh, routes. Can you please proceed with that and also comment, uh, comment, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, reasoning, yeah, uh, why okay. do you make certain decisions here? Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's write a simple server than with Express because it is more easier to do it with that. Um, it is more simpler. So first of all, we need to import Express. Of course, we need to install it firstly. We will not be doing it here. And then um, we need to make an instance of express here and to make it listen to some particular port example 8000 we need to use this method also we can pass some callback to console log it Mm. listening at port something like this okay so what should we have here we need a router yes um, so we need a router it is it should be user router let's call it user router this oh, yeah. I guess it was something like this. I haven't used it express recently. So it has a router class. Yes, it has a router class and I guess it is creates an experience. The express function is in top. Okay, I guess it's correct. And then we can we need to use this router in our application. Can do it by using use method that is for middlewares. And we need to pass here the the URL, and I guess we need to do it like this user. Okay, let's try it. And user router. So sorry, it is there, and now we need to add some routes to our router. So we will need to firstly host some some users. So we will have a callback here. It will just 
let's have an array of users so we will have request response and also next but we don't need next right now and we can get some body of the request and let's just put it in the user's array so and we may want to respond somehow um send or status uh usually we send 201 for creating endpoints we also can send a message created user and we can be adding other endpoints so let me just copy and paste here so it will be now get um now we will be sending it sending our array and we might want to update the user we can do it uh, by using potent point so i will not write the logic here so we will we will need to find the user here oh we need to update the the url here because we'll need to get an id of the user we'll find the user by id in this array update it and we may want to return it some kind of user undated dated user oh also to make it full crude operation we need to delete the user as well um so um again we will need id to find the user delete it and we might want to return the flag is deleted like true or false um okay we have full crud we use it this router in our application and we now need error handler um we can use express itself has um, error handler middleware that accepts um that accepts uh, the error as a first parameter here and everything else next So this uh, middleware will be called only when we have an error that is not etched anyhow, and when we don't send any uh, any request or um, when we don't send any response from our server, we will need to we will need to handle the error. Let's just log it for now. And we might want to respond somehow. For example, um, and status 500, send unexpected error. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is pretty much it. Do yep. we need anything else? No, no. Uh, just 
want, uh, yeah, assuming that, of course, it's a uh, code base for, um, you know, uh, on the spot, uh, it's definitely not a be- be- best practice. Uh, and But I want uh, to, but it looks good, yeah, in order like, to have some simple uh, basic server in place for crude operations. I just want to um, th- uh, like discuss further this example and talk about how would you do it for production uh, ready application. For example, uh, but let's start small. Uh, would uh, do would you? I see you named the resource here user. Uh, I sometimes see uh, mo- most most often I see that it's called like users in plural. Uh, do you think what do you think about this like idea? Uh, what, what approach you follow in uh, your practice? I guess usually in uh, REST uh, APIs uh, we use singular words, not plural ones. Uh, and uh, so if we go by the principles of REST, we need to name them singularly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. By the way, what uh, the principle of REST, uh, just, you know, we jump in here uh, about some uh, also theory. Uh, for example, like, did you hear about Richardson uh, maturity model uh, about REST? Or you you see you are uh, like uh, some specific like best practices that you know uh, the principle of rest that you uh, just read from the definition of this uh, pattern. I haven't heard about Richardson's principles. Never. Uh-huh. I know just uh, some principles of restful APIs uh-huh. when they can be fully restful APIs. Uh, for that, they need to be uh, like cacheable. They need to be a layered system, uh, which means that when you add some some layers in between your uh, server and front end, nothing uh, nothing gets broken. And uh, there was something like uniform interface. There are overall five or six uh, principles uh, of REST to be a RESTful API. Okay, got it. Uh, okay, we discussed this one. About error handling, uh, what practices do you use about, you know, if you ro- if you write this for production, uh, for specific routes? Uh, so you now did the error handling like in one place uh, and also you send 500 status. Would you send this 500 status all the time or would you consider some other statuses uh, upon different conditions uh, to be sent to the cloud? Uh, action, I would um, probably, I would be looking for the type of the error. Like uh, I would have uh, different uh, errors, for example, not found error or bad request error. And uh, I would check it here in my uh, error handler. And depending on the type of the error, I would return the particular status. Because, for example, for not found error, we need to send 404. Uh, for bad request, we usually send 403. Mm-hmm. Uh, for for bad request for a three for four hundred if I remember for three for uh, unauthenticated something. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. I just uh, want to clarify. Uh, often that I uh, as a front end developer, for example, like uh, for front end, uh, uh, it would be convenient for me to understand why it's bad request. I mean, ju- not just no. I try to create a user, yeah, uh, but I just want to understand maybe why it's considered bad request, yeah. For me to have more information, uh, how would you, uh, as a backend developer, for example, if I'm talking to you and uh, as a backend developer, how would you make uh, it so for me to have more messages, uh, context specific? Yeah, that for example, you have like a bunch of different routes. Yeah, it can be posts, it can be messages, it can be r- users. But I, specifically for the user, I want to understand that why it's bad request for the user. Usually, uh, for example. When a bad request happens, uh, for example, when the coming data is incorrect or the coming data is invalid, 
uh, is different type. And in this case, we usually check it here in our uh, handler of the endpoint. And if we find any invalid, uh, invalid parameter, invalid, invalid field coming, uh, we usually like throw an error, throw a new error, for example, and pass a message here. And uh, I would, this will be, for example, not found error. I will pass a message, something like uh, name should be a yeah. text. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, in my error handler, I would pass this uh, the same message uh, in the body of the response, like here. Yeah. I can make something like this message, and error. By the way, uh, just uh, talking from your experience, did you uh, did you use such methods, uh, this, uh, like uh, approaches, like schema validation for uh, this like input? Uh, Input. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how, yeah. how can you explain it? Uh, what is it, and uh, you know uh, why it is needed? I don't really remember how does it work in Express, uh, <laughs> but in Fastify, for yeah. example, uh, I have been working with it uh, recently, mostly with it, and uh, it has uh, its own uh, its own validation. Uh, whether Express doesn't have. Uh, so in Express, we need to install something uh, outside of the box. Uh, but in Fastify, uh, what we do, uh, we set some rules for each uh, field that that may come from the front-end side, for example. Uh, like, for example, name, name of the user, uh, it should be a text. It should be, it should contain no more than 100 symbols, for example, and it is uh, mandatory. It, it is required uh, for post request, for example. For put request, it is not required, it, it becomes optional. So uh, for each endpoint, we write uh, their own validation. Yeah. yeah. Uh so final questions uh, not gonna be in much details and of course i understand we didn't discuss uh, many such important topics like authentication cookies etc but uh, yeah let's proceed uh, with question um to yeah to understand different uh, different uh, like alternatives to http uh, for example like uh, web sockets uh, graphql can you and also uh, long polling, short polling. Can you just in in uh, in little bit describe all of these like approaches and why they make sense in certain conditions uh, uh, and in what cases would you use them? In what cases you won't uh, use them? Just to, to not hear only some good things about them, but also with, with some like uh, criticism. Uh, you know uh, vi that will help you to decide to not use them in certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Um probably I haven't worked in uh, I, haven't, I haven't worked with websockets and I haven't done any pooling. But uh, I know that websockets usually use it in uh, some messaging applications, in some messengers, and um, it makes the connection between one and uh, between two sides and helps to share uh shared data um that's it what i know about it but i have worked with graphql a bit and it is somehow similar to rest but there are really big differences also um graphql the main the main um advantage of graphql is that um we can we can make one request to get data so for example it is usually called uh, slash graphql and that's it you send get a http request to that server and describe the describe the data that you want to get 
So you don't need to write uh, tens of uh, get requests to get uh, particular data as in REST, because in REST, you need to write uh, each endpoint to get users, to get subscriptions, to get uh, games, for example, and so on. But in GraphQL, um, you will have only one endpoint, and the front-end side can describe themselves what they want to see in the request or uh, in the response. Um, what is the disadvantage of GraphQL? Um, Let me provide you some like, use case I had in the past recently. Uh, I, as usually, I see uh, some uh, uh, services uh, that you need to subscribe, I mean, in order for them to use, also provide some uh, GraphQL API, but they also like uh, provide some limits uh, for for the usage of this API because if we think uh, API can be constructed in a way to you know to have some um, data query constructed in a way that it can try to reach everything and also circular like uh, in circle uh, circular like uh, uh, dependencies when you well, for example like from one user request uh, another user and in this user request. And other users, for example, if we think about some social media, social uh, network platform, right? Uh, uh, so th there is, did you have such, um, you know, uh, cases when you need to account for such uh, edge cases uh, for GraphQL? Um, or you did not mostly use the GraphQL rather than implementing it uh, yourself? Uh, I haven't implemented it, and I, I guess I know what you are talking about. Uh -huh. uh, probably it is the most uh, popular question about GraphQL, popular yeah. problem. Um, um, yeah, I it's called N plus one problem. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I have, I have faced it before, but now I don't remember what was it about and how to solve it. No problem. Yeah, no problem. Just it's great that you know uh, that you he heard about it. Uh, this is you know something about our work that we have a lot of uh, information. Uh, you know, we hear it uh, occasionally. Yeah, at least uh, uh, in my in my routine, I just make sure that at least I know like roughly what it is about. And in cases if needed, I will double check it additionally. Uh, especially now with the AI tools, it's uh, really easy. But with that, yes, thank you very much, Exot, for your answers. So, great, guys. We've got it. Nice. Uh, thank you very much, both Victor and Shagzot, uh, for this really great, exciting interview. Uh, before we proceed to the next step, I would like to tell you something. So this is a Gen AI adoption program for engineering teams. Uh, which is about how to integrate uh, the Gen AI toolset in the product development process and uh, boost the uh, team performance. So, uh, generally, this is a transformative 12-week uh, program that uh, integrates uh, Gen AI tools to your uh, operations and uh, actually it redefines the development process. Our uh, NGX unique uh, three-pillar approach of performance management, optimization and hands-on uh, AI coaching both group coaching and individual coaching uh, has been proven successful for over 40 client projects. Basically, it uh, goes uh, way beyond through just uh, implementing some techniques of uh, Gen AI tools. It's about also about the whole development process, uh, tuning all the development process and uh, helping uh, the teams to overcome the resistance to change that leads to significant boost in productivity. So on our experiences from 15 to up to 50% productivity gains. Uh, also, we'd like to introduce the EPUM dial, uh, our EPUM's uh, AI toolkit uh, that provides uh, more than 10 AI platforms uh, in the toolkit. So basically it's ChatGPT, Copilot, Gemini, and so on and so on. So you have access to all of them. Uh, and you don't share your internal information uh, to the LLMs as you do in the uh, public versions. Now let's get back to the interview. And uh, I would like uh, to ask you to provide some feedback to each other. And I would like first to introduce uh, Victor. 
I want to say that, yeah, I think interview went good. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I asked some uh, deep questions to understand the limits of Shrekzad. Uh, I think uh, Shrekzad, you know, uh, you understand about some areas that you can improve based on this interview. But I think for lead, uh, for middle position, you did uh, a great job. Uh, and most importantly, as usual, uh, that you already have this uh, production experience. We can uh, talk about theory uh, for days, yeah, but... Uh, uh, what usually uh, is uh, uh, important for me is that you already like write some production code for real projects, uh, so you uh, have such experience, and of course uh, uh, you have it. So, um, but yeah, uh, just for this interview, uh, we uh, discussed uh, like uh, general topics uh, and. Uh, uh, about some uh, quality, about testing, and Shaksat uh, managed to answer them uh, great. Also, uh, important topic right now, even in, uh, for IPAM as well, I mean, as well as for other uh, industries like clouds, and Shaksat also has experience with clouds, uh, with AWS specifically, which is the most popular cloud right now. And um, yeah, uh, we did not touch uh, a lot about frameworks, not just frameworks, but Shakzat wrote some sample application for Express, and we discussed some areas potential that can be uh, that it can be improved for production to be considered production ready. Uh, and of course, we discussed uh, the, the heart of the uh, Node.js uh, event loop, and uh, Shakzat was capable of uh, managing it uh, perfectly. So overall. Uh, I think Shakzad did a great job. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that, uh, that's all that I can say. Thank you so much. Uh, now I think that uh, Shakzad, you could also share a couple of thoughts about the interview process. Yeah, it was a pleasure to participate in this uh, interview. Um, you know, because it was more like just a conversation with a person about some uh, experience of mine. And also during the interview, I got some some things, some the details that will be really useful and helpful in my further career and experience. Yeah, thank you very much for your feedback. So, Victor, what's the verdict? Like I said, I think it went good. So I would hire uh, Shakzad. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, all the compensation about the stuff is not on me. <laughs>So what I would like to say, going back to the courses and the programs that I announced, uh, I would like to remind you about uh, Anywhere Club and Nginx. This is a great career path for you, those who want to uh, pass interviews to EPAM or to any other uh, tech uh, companies uh, like uh, EPAM. Uh, and also for the teams that already work in the pro inside the process, how to implement the AI. This is also um, very important from our point of view, and it is a really bestseller from our from our perspective. So, uh, what what I would like to say: uh, all the links will be available in the description. Like, share, repost, and stay tuned.